All right. Uh, welcome back. Hope you had a good uh, spring break. Uh, we're going to continue our discussion of knowledge today. Uh, first, a few announcements. So, uh, first of all, if you have uh, not begun, do begin soon. You've got an essay due uh, and not all that long. Um, C2 is now available for you to fill out. Uh, we really uh, benefit from your feedback in these courses. Uh, we read all your comments. Uh, we sometimes make adjustments to how things go based on your feedback. Um, you yourselves are the beneficiaries of the generations of Monash students who have taken this course before you and given us their feedback. So um, th this isn't a course that I sort of came up with on a whim or that Jenny came up with on a whim. Uh, we've been refining it over the years, and we expect it will get better as we hear uh, more from how you guys are interacting with the texts, with the course, uh, and so forth. So do share your thoughts. Uh, also, this particular class, uh, it's going to go a lot better if you're sitting near someone. There's going to be a handful of occasions where uh, you need to discuss. So if you're sitting by yourself, move to somewhere where you can easily turn and talk to someone. Oh, and then lastly, there was a comment that came up on Moodle um, concerning uh, whether or not we'll put up a sample exam. Uh, we will. We do. Uh, there will be no surprises on the final exam. Uh, we're going to give you a set of essay questions, and the whole exam will be based around those. So if you're able to answer all those essay questions, you'll be fit to do well on the exam. Uh, if you've taken LDM, you'll be happy to know that. This exam is a little different. Uh, there's some multiple choice and less essay writing. So it's, a, a, I think, a more enjoyable exam to take. Anyway, um, we'll post that shortly, um, I imagine. Uh, but certainly within four weeks of the, the final exam. All right. So where we're at. We started two weeks ago with this question, what is knowledge, right? What we're working up to is uh, an answer to this question, what do we know, if anything, right? We want to deal with skepticism, right? Remember, skepti skeptics say you don't know anything, or at least you don't know as much as you think you know. But to have a good response to the skeptic, you got to get reasonably clear on what you're talking about when you're talking about knowledge. And what we did last time was introduce you to the historically influential account that knowledge is justified true belief, right? You know something, right? For You know that there's a chair near you. In case, just in case you believe there's a chair near you, it's true there's a chair near you, and you've got justification for believing that. Um, what we saw was that this is inadequate. There are cases where you have justified true beliefs, but you don't have knowledge, right? These are Gettier cases. Um, so let me just jog your memory really quick. So this is just to make sure you're all up to speed, um, given that you've had a week away from this. So remember this case, right, Coin's case. Walt is told by the boss that Gail will get the job. Walt also knows that Gail's got 10 coins in his pocket. He's seen Gail count them and recount them many times. And so Walt infers from this that the guy who will get the job has 10 coins in his pocket. He's right. right? This is a true belief. Because uh, as it turns out, Walt's going to get the job. The boss is going to change his mind. And as it happens, Walt does have 10 coins in his pocket. Right? So he has a justified true belief, but he doesn't have knowledge. Uh, different case. Right? Suppose you're traveling through the land of fake zebras. You don't know this. Uh, but it's something the locals do to boost tourism, right? They, they know the visitors like zebras. Um, and you turn and look and look at a zebra, right? You, you, but you happen to be lucky. This is the one real zebra in all the region. Had you been anywhere else in the region at any other point in time and seen a zebra-like thing, it would not have been a zebra. Many people have thought uh, that this is a case where you don't have knowledge, right? It's too easy. Uh, you could have too easily gotten this wrong, it said. Uh, but take this with a grain of salt. Remember when I asked you about this, uh, about half of you said this is not a case of knowledge, and the other half said it is. Uh, there's debate about this, and just keep that flag in your mind. Different case, 
that virtually all of you agreed was not a case of knowledge, despite being a case of justified true belief. The sheep case. Uh, you're traveling through the country. You look. You see a thing that looks for all the world like a sheep. Right? It's fluffy. It's white. Um, so you just think, on the basis of that visual experience, sheep are in the field. You're right. Sheep are in the field. But they're beyond your view. right? They're on the other side of the hill. Um, so you have a justified true belief. But it's not a case of knowledge. Right? It's not a case of knowledge. You guys all right? No, 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 yeah, I don't care. Okay. Um, so where does that land us? It lands us here. Um, you know something, just in case you have a justified true belief, according to the traditional account, you have a bunch of counterexamples that show that the JTB account, the traditional account, is insufficient. So what we're off hunting for is some additional condition. Knowledge is justified true belief plus something else. And it's that plus something else that we're after. It's that plus something else that we're after. All right. So Goldman in the 60s, um, he was reflecting on these Gettier cases. And he thought he landed on an adequate condition. Right? Um, what he noticed was that in all the Gettier cases, there's a failure to have an appropriate causal connection between the fact believed and the belief itself. The fact believed and the belief itself. And he, so his proposal was that we just add this bit. We make their, uh, we, we introduce into our account of knowledge a causal requirement. We say that knowledge is true belief plus condition three here, the fact that what is believed, P, um, the fact that it's true causes your belief, right? So your belief is in part a causal, um, an effect of the fact that what you believe is true. Uh, there's something you should notice about this that makes it immediately different than the traditional JTB account. Anybody see what's different? Knowledge is justified true belief. This says knowledge is true belief plus a causal condition. Knowledge is justified true. Well, where's the justification bit, right? Where's the J? Um, well, in this article, he doesn't give us the J. In other articles, uh, he argues that this causal condition uh, gets us, or something much like this causal condition anyway gets us justification. So think of justification as being uh, an, uh, an effect of the causal condition being satisfied right, for Goldman. Goldman uh, elsewhere argues that if something like three obtains, then you have justification. Right? So justification is here, but it's implicit. Okay. So how does it do? Well, it does really well with perceptual knowledge. Right? So you know that there's a chair in front of you unless you're in the very front row. No one is. Uh, you know that there's a chair in front of you, just in case it's true, you believe it, and the fact that it's true is causally responsible for your belief. Are those three conditions satisfied? Yeah, right? It's true that there's a chair in front of you. You believe there's a chair in front of you, and the fact that there's a chair in front of you causes your belief or at least your belief is in part causally, um, uh, your belief is in part a, an effect of there being a chair. Right, because right? what's the chair doing? Well, the chair is uh, interacting with light waves in a way that bounces off your eyes and you get the image in your head. If there were no chair, you wouldn't have the same visual experience as you're having now and you wouldn't have the belief. Right? So the fact that there's a chair is in part causally responsible for your belief. And this is really easy to um, you know, give uh, a number of other examples in the case of perception. Another big mark in favor of this account is it avoids the counterexamples uh, we've just talked about. So think about the sheep case. You see a fluffy animal in the field. It looks very, very sheep-like. So you believe sheep's in the field. You're right. You can't see it. All right. Um, 
So a bunch of questions here. Uh, obviously, we've already discussed question zero and question one. This is not a case of knowledge. You don't know sheep are in the field, right? You're just you're forming a belief in response to a non-sheep-like thing, a non-sheep thing that looks very sheep-like. Um, you do have justified true belief, uh, and so the traditional account says you do have knowledge. So that's a problem for the traditional account. Uh, question two. Recall before we were talking about Harmon's account of knowledge, right? Harmon said the way to solve all Gettier problems is to say this. Knowledge is justified true belief that isn't based on any false belief. But the sheep case was a problem for Harmon's account too, right? Because in the sheep case, you're not forming a belief on the basis of beliefs. You're forming a belief on the basis of a perceptual experience. Perceptual experiences are not beliefs. Um, so on Harmon's account, you do have knowledge in the sheep case. It's a problem for Harmon's account. Um, is it a problem for um, uh, Goldman's causal account? Point to the person next to you, register your thoughts. So question three. All right, so um, in the sheep case, do you have a true belief that sheep are in the field? Yeah, you have a true belief that sheep are in the field. Is the fact that sheep are in the field causally responsible for your belief? Yeah, yeah virtually all of you are shaking your head no. That's right. So this is a mark in favor of Goldman's account. Because what does it say? This is not a case of knowledge. Because this third condition for knowledge is not satisfied. All right, so good. We're resilient to at least one Gettier case. Uh, what about another? Um, there, there's a typo here. In the yellow box, it should read, um, well, this is my question to you. It says the fact that the person who has 10 coins in his pocket will get the job cause Walt to believe it. All right, so forget, it shouldn't read Gale. It should be the person with 10 coins in their pocket. Um, all right, so Walt, does he have a true belief that the person who will get the job has 10 coins in his pocket? Yeah, he has a true belief. He believes it, and in fact, he has 10 coins in his pocket, so it's true, because um, he's the one who's gonna end up getting the job. Um, but is the fact that he has 10 coins in his pocket playing any causal role whatsoever in his believing it? A lot of you are nodding your heads no, that's right. Um, why is that? Or put differently, what, what, is what is doing the causal work? Why does he believe what he believes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so his belief is in part a response to the fact that he's been told by a reliable authority that Gail will get the job, and that he's seen that Gail has 10 coins in his pocket. Right? These are what are causing his belief. Right? The fact that he has 10 coins in his pocket is playing no causal role whatsoever. Right? His pocket conta could contain 100 coins, and he'd still believe that the person who will get the job has 10 coins in his pocket. His pocket could be empty, 
And he'd still believe that the person who will get the job has 10 coins in his pocket. Um, the fact that he has 10 coins in his pocket plays no role whatsoever in explaining why he has the belief that he has. Is this good news for Goldman's account? Yeah, it's pretty good news. Because on Goldman's account, the third condition is not satisfied. Right? Third condition is not satisfied. So this is not knowledge. So here's another Gettier case that Goldman's causal account can easily brush aside. All right, how about this? Why don't you turn to the person next to you and uh, address this question. On Goldman's causal account, is this a case of knowledge or is it not? The zebra case. All right. All right, so um, Goldman's causal account. What does Goldman have to say about this case? Is this a case of knowledge? All right. Um, anybody unclear as to why this is a case of knowledge on his account? All right. Yeah, so it is a case of knowledge on his account because the fact that he's seen a zebra is explaining his belief. It's, if you were not looking, uh, or excuse me, I shouldn't say it like this. Um, on Goldman's account, you've got knowledge in case you have a true belief. And so long as the fact that is believed is explaining causally your belief, then you've got knowledge. The fact that he's seeing a zebra is explaining his belief that he sees a zebra. Now, the question is whether or not you think this is a problem. right? If you think that this is a Gettier case, you think this is a problem for Goldman's account. Right, if you think that this is a case, in the sense of it's a ca not a case of knowledge. But if you think that this is a case of knowledge, you think this is no problem for his account whatsoever. All right, so why don't you uh, quickly register your thought with the person next to you. Do you think this is a case of knowledge or do you not? All right, so just as a, a matter of curiosity, um, so those of you who are inclined, those of you who are inclined, all right, come back, thanks. Those of you who are inclined to think that this is a case of knowledge, would you raise your hand? I just, you feel like it is. And those of you who are disinclined, this is not knowledge, all right. 
So those of you who think that this is not, you think, ah, maybe there's something wrong with Goldman's account. Those of you who think that this is knowledge, think this is not a problem for Goldman's account. In fact, this is a marking, oh, I was actually right. Those of you who think that this is knowledge, think that this is a mark in favor of Goldman's account. Um, because Goldman's account is getting something right by your life. Right? So this is something uh, that for you speaks in favor. Um, fortunately, we don't have to spend too much time on this because there are other problems with Goldman's account. So even if uh, you thought that uh, this is not a case of knowledge and is a problem, you don't have to, you know, draw a line in the sand here, right? There's some clear problems. Right, let's think about this case, right? Max, he's developed a brain lesion that occasionally affects him, right, his mind, in different ways. Sometimes it causes him to feel happy, sometimes sad, sometimes it makes him hallucinate. One day the brain lesion affects his mind in the following way. It causes him to form the belief that he has a brain lesion. All right. Uh, first question, do you think Max knows that he has a brain lesion? Do you think Max knows? Just see where you're at. If you're inclined to think he does not have knowledge, would you raise your hand? No knowledge? So some of you are, are feel, looking hesitant. I, I want to encourage you. Uh, this is not a case where you should be hesitant. Um, Max has no reasons for his belief. Right? He just has his mind being manipulated by a blind force, and it just randomly produces changes in his brain. Sometimes he's happy. Sometimes he's sad. Other times, he hallucinates, right? He looks out on Melbourne, and he sees the New York City skyline somehow, and he sees walruses drinking martinis, right? He just, his mind's being oddly affected. Now, and here's one effect of the lesion. He ends up, guys, can you stop talking? Okay. Um, he ends up with this belief that he has a lesion. Now, good news for him, it's a true belief, right? This isn't like the, uh, the martini drinking walrus case. Right, this is, he, he has a true belief here. Um, but he doesn't have knowledge, right? He has no reasons for his belief. But what does the causal theory imply? Causal theory says you have knowledge, or Max knows that he has a brain lesion. If, one, he has a brain lesion, two, he believes it, and the fact that he has a brain lesion causes him to believe that he has a brain lesion. Are all three conditions satisfied? Yeah. Oh, and you said no? Oh, you don't know? All right, well, we just walked through it. Uh, right, so Max knows that he has a brain lesion in case he does, right? That's condition one. Uh, and it's satisfied because he does in this case. Condition two, he believes he has a brain lesion, right? He does in this case. Right, that's what the lesion does. It causes him to believe he has a lesion. And then condition three, the fact that he has a lesion, right, the fact that it's true that he has a lesion, causes him to believe he has a lesion. So condition three is satisfied. Uh -huh. So causal relations go either way. Um, so you can have uh, proximate and remote causal uh, causes. Uh, it doesn't matter if, excuse me guys, thanks. It doesn't matter if the, the cause is direct or indirect, uh, according to Goldman's account. Um, or at least Goldman doesn't get very specific. But in this case here, it's not meant to be built into the case that the hallucination causes the belief that he has a lesion. It's just a direct result of the lesion itself. Right, so that's uh, how I intended this case to be read. Um, so even if we wanted to make uh, trouble with this case on the basis of this direct versus indirect causes business, 
just we just change the case so it's clearly a direct cause of the lesion, and that's how this was intended to be read. Does that make sense? Uh, let me let me just go at it again. Uh, suppose we've got a series of dominoes, right? Um, the last one falls down. Did the first one cause it to fall down? Yeah, the first one caused it to fall down, but not it wasn't a direct cause. Right, it was an indirect cause because it caused other dominoes that in turn directly caused the final domino to fall. So similarly here, you've got the lesion, and as you've thought of it, you've got the lesion causing other things that cause belief that I have a lesion or that Max has a lesion. Um, causes can be direct or indirect. Uh, we just make it clear in the case by saying, that the cause of his belief that he has a lesion is a direct cause. And this circumvents this worry about indirect causes and what trouble they might make for Goldman's account. Great. <laughs> um, all right, so this is, this is trouble. Um, right, we can duplicate the case quite easily. So suppose I have a zapping gun. Um, and each time I hit you with it, it causes you to form a perfectly random belief. Uh, there's the, the gun has no felt effect. When you're hit with a zapping gun, you don't know, you, you don't, it doesn't tingle, it doesn't hurt. Uh, it just immediately produces a random belief. So I shoot you once with a zapping gun, you believe you're on Venus. Uh, I shoot you again with a zapping gun and you believe uh, some horses can fly. And I shoot you again with a zapping gun and you believe you might be a Martian. And on and on. And the 251st time I shoot you with this, you form the belief, I've been shot with a zapping gun. Now, do you know that you've been shot with a zapping gun in this scenario? Now, this is just like the brain lesion scenario. You don't have knowledge, right? You just happen to have a true belief, right? But you have no reasons for your belief. But what does Goldman's account imply? It implies that you have knowledge. Because it's true, you've been shot with a zapping gun. You believe you've been shot with a zapping gun. And condition three, the fact that you've been shot with a zapping gun has caused you to believe it. So there's the causal connection. Okay, so this is trouble. Any question about this case? See why it's problematic for Goldman's causal account? Um, there are other problems with Goldman's causal account that I won't drag you through. Let's just turn to Nozick's account. Um, Nozick says the causal account is getting something right. And the causal account is getting something right, right? Because remember, it avoided certain Gettier cases. Right, like the sheep case and the coin case. Um, but on, according to Nozick, the reason the causal account was getting some things right is because certain counterfactuals ride on the back of causal relations. Uh, here's what that means. Uh, counterfactual conditionals are statements like three and four. If something were the case, something else would be the case. If something were not the case, something else would or would not be the case. Or if such and so were the case and something might be the case, might not be the case. Right? Were, would, might, might not. Right? These are counterfactual conditions or counterfactual claims. Nozick says two counterfactual claims uh, play an important role in our concept of knowledge. Or two counterfactual conditions play an important role in our concept of knowledge. Um, the reason Goldman's account was getting some things right is because when something causes something else, ordinarily the following counterfactual is true. If the cause were absent, the effect would be absent. Right? If the lesion causes your belief, no lesion, if you were not to have the lesion, you would not have the belief. And Nozick says it's these counterfactual relations that are actually at work in our concept of knowledge. Let's see how that goes. Um, but first, let, let's talk a little bit more about conditional, uh, counterfactual conditionals. All right, so you've got would statements or would counterfactuals. If P were true, something else would be true. Um, you've got might and might not 
counterfactual statements if something were true and something else might or might not be true. Uh, so if I were to run a red light, I might get a ticket, I might not get a ticket would be an example. And you've got would not counterfactual statements. If P were true, P would not be true. An instance would be if I were to run a red light, I would not get a ticket. Um, here's an important uh, relation that obtains among these kinds of counterfactuals. Um, the would counterfactual statement, like W, if I were to run a red light, I would get a ticket. That's inconsistent with the latter two counterfactuals. Right? It can't be true that if I were to get a ticket, excuse me, it can't be true that if I were to run a red light, I would get a ticket. If it's also true that if I were to run a red light, I might not get a ticket. And it can't be true that if I were to run a red light, I would get a ticket. If it's also true that if I were to run a red light, I would not get a ticket. Right? So the would counterfactual, the first one, is inconsistent with the other two. So here's a neat test you could perform if you're trying to evaluate the truth of any given counterfactual conditional. Uh, see if a might or might not counterfactual is true, or see if a would not counterfactual is true. And if they are, then you know that the corresponding would counterfactual has to be false. Um, put differently, um, if W is clearly true, right? If a would counterfactual is true, then you know that the might might not counterfactual, and you know that the would not counterfactual statement can't be true. Um, let me just walk you through a couple examples. Right, so here's a would counterfactual. If I were to flip a coin, it would land heads. We want to ask the question, is that true? Well, what about the might counterfactual? If I were to flip a fair coin, might it not land tails? Yeah, it's clearly true that it might land tails, right, if it's a fair coin. Um, so if that's true, we know that the would counterfactual here, the one, is false. Right, and we know that it's false because the might counterfactual is true. If you were to play chess against the chess master, he would win. Right. That seems right. If you're bad at chess, like many people are, um, if you go up against the master, uh, you're going to lose. Right? If you were to play a master, you would lose. And so we know that the following is false. If you were to play a master, you might win. Or if you were to play a master, he would not win. Right? You know that those both have to be false. Um, right, we can walk through a lot of examples, um, but maybe it's just more helpful to pause. Uh, any questions about counterfactual statements? Or counterfactual is just a term philosophers use to refer to would, would not, might, might not type statements. All right, let's see what kind of work it can do for us in theory of knowledge. Um, so, take the sheep case. Uh, on Nozick's tracking account, you know that sheep are in the field in case it's true that sheep are in the field. Do you believe sheep are in the field? And if it were not true that sheep are in the field, you would not believe it. So is this counterfactual condition satisfied in the sheep case? Why don't you turn to the person next to you? Register your thought.
All right, that's probably uh, good enough. Um, what do you think? Would you believe sheep are in the fields even if there were no sheep in the fields? Yeah, that's what she's saying. Uh, so condition three is not satisfied. Right? And if condition three is not satisfied, then one of the essential conditions for knowing isn't satisfied on Nozick's account. So this is not knowledge. That's great. That's just what our intuitions tell us. This is not a case of knowledge. Um, all right, it's good news for Nozick. Oh, what about the coin case? Uh, is condition three satisfied in this case? Recall, Walt believes that the person who has 10 coins in his pocket will get the job. Um, if that were not true, would Walt not believe it? Right, so think about what it would mean for that not to be true. Uh, that would be for Walt to have more or less than 10 coins in his pocket. Let's say Walt had 12 coins in his pocket. Would he still believe that the person who will get the job has 10 coins in his pocket? Yep, sure would. Uh, so condition three is not satisfied. Right? And this is great news for Nozick's tracking account of knowledge because Nozick's tracking account of knowledge says and explains or purports to explain why Walt lacks knowledge. Walt lacks knowledge because he fails to satisfy condition three. All right. uh, what about the brain lesion case? All right, so um, you know something on Nozick's account if it's true, you believe it, and condition three, if P were not true, you would not believe it. And condition four, we're ignoring for the moment. All right, so think about the lesion case. Max has a lesion, it affects his mind in various ways. One day, the lesion causes him, directly, to have the belief that he has a lesion. Is condition three satisfied on Nozick's account? All right, so why don't you turn to the person next to you? Is condition three satisfied? All right, so uh, what do you think? Um, is condition three satisfied? Is condition three satisfied? Yeah, all right, a lot of you are saying yes. Um, yeah, and that's, that's right, condition three is clearly satisfied. Why is that? Well, think again, why does Max believe what he believes? He believes he has a lesion because he has a lesion. So if it were not true, that is, if he were not to have a lesion, right, you'd, he'd lose the belief, right, because a lesion is causing his belief. No cause, no effect. All right, so this is potentially a problem, right, because Nozick's, on Nozick's view, the first three conditions for knowledge are satisfied. All right, so if Nozick's going to avoid this counterexample that Goldman faced, the fourth condition's going to have to do a little bit of work for him. All right, so... What do you think about the fourth condition? Is this satisfied? This is trickier. Why don't you turn to the person next to you and discuss?
right. So um, what do you think about the fourth condition? Is it satisfied in this case? If P were true, then S would believe P. That means in this case, um, if he were to have a lesion, then he would believe that he has a lesion. If he were to have a lesion, then he would believe that he has a lesion. Is that true? So a lot of you are shaking your heads no. Anybody have a hazard a guess as to why? Very good. Um, think about uh, if you had a coin in your pocket, you consider the question, if I were to flip it, would it land heads, uh, right? No, the answer is it might land heads, but it might not. A lesion like this, remember the description of the case, this lesion affects your mind in odd random ways. Sometimes you hallucinate, sometimes you feel happy, sometimes you feel sad. Um, sometimes it causes you to form a belief. <laughs> that you have a lesion. Um, it's true that it might cause him, and in this case, it does in fact cause him to believe he has a lesion. But does, that doesn't mean that it's true that if he has a lesion, he would believe it, right? It's just because uh, you flip a coin and it happens to land heads doesn't mean if you were to flip a coin, it would land heads, right? It's still true that if you were to flip a coin, it might land heads, but it might not. Um, so condition four isn't satisfied on Nozick's account. Um, before I press on to the next case, would you like to ask any other questions about that? It's tricky, but think of the coin flip and might and might not counterfactuals. And that can help you get a sense of why condition four isn't satisfied. All right. um, think about the zapping gun case. Uh, the third condition is met, right? If you had not been zapped with a zapping gun, you wouldn't believe you'd been zapped with a zapping gun. Um, so condition three holds, right? If you were not zapped, you would not believe it. Uh, but is it is the following true? Condition four: If you were if you were zapped, then you would believe that you were zapped. Here's the reason to think the answer is no. Remember, this causes random beliefs. You're shot. 250 times and form beliefs in all kinds of other things. And it's only by accident on the 251st time that you end up with the belief that you've been shot with a zapping gun. Right? It's not true that if you were shot with it, you'd form the belief. Right? It's true that if you were shot with it, you might form the belief, but you might not. Right? So it can't be true that if you were shot with it, then you would form the belief. Uh, so condition four is not satisfied. And this is, again, great news for Nozick's account. Uh, we've got an account of knowledge on the table that so far avoids the counterexamples, spaghettiier cases, and avoids these odd cases that the causal account did not avoid. Right? The causal account failed to the zapping gun case. The causal account failed, uh, uh, fell to um, uh, the lesion case. Right? These are not cases that cause problems for Nozick's. So we've got a, a kind of knowledge on the table that's doing a lot of good work for us. Um, there's more to say about Nozick's account. Uh, any questions, though? Got a feel for how it works. Got a feel for how to think about counterfactuals. Uh, they can hurt your head, uh, these would, when, might, might not statements. Uh, you know, when you think about them too much, too long. Um, so I'm going to leave you with that. Next class, we're going to introduce a wrinkle in Nozick's account and see if we can't iron out the wrinkle. Um, so stay tuned.